Hi, everybody. My name is Alexis Boylan. Um, I am the uh, Director of Academic Affairs here at UCHI, um, and I welcome you. Before we get started, I wanted to say in this moment where many of us are working in different places and meeting remotely, we acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are gathered and of the lands where remote participants are currently working, and we recognize their continued connection to land, waters, and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. We have an excellent event for you today featuring Audrey Waters in her latest book, Teaching Machines, The History of Personalized Learning, um, with the best cover ever. We were having a conversation about it before. It's really fantastic. Um, this was co-sponsored by the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning and the NEAG School of Education. To make sure that you always know what we have planned at the Institute, you can follow us on social media or subscribe to our listserv and monthly newsletter. You can find all of these links at the footer on our website, of, uh, our website and our address is humanities.ucon.edu. Audrey Waters is a writer and independent scholar who focuses on educational technology, education technology, its politics and its pedagogical implications. Although she was two chapters into her comparative literature dissertation, she decided to ab abandon academia and now happily fulfills the one job recommended to her by a junior high aptitude test, a freelance writer. She has written for The Baffler, The Atlantic, Vice, Hybrid Pedagogy, Inside Higher Ed, and the School Library Journal and elsewhere across the web, but she is best known for the work on her website, Hack Education. Audrey has given keynotes and presentations on education technology around the world and is the author of several books, including The Monsters of Education Technology, The Revenge of the Monsters of, Techno of, edu of Education Technology, The Curse of the Monsters of Education Technology, The Monsters of Education Technology 4, and Claim Your Domain. Her latest book, Teaching Machines, MIT Press, examines the prehistory of, quote, personalized learning. Audrey was a recipient of the Spencer Education Journalism Fellowship at Columbia University for the 2017-18 academic year. Elizabeth Della Zelazaria is a historian of modern Europe and a postdoctoral research associate at the Humanities Institute. Her scholarship focuses on how ideas move on the ground, how their method of transmission and dissemination affects the ideas themselves, with a particular emphasis on the intellectual history of material text and urban environments in revolutionary and post-revolutionary France. And with that, I am going to hand over um, uh, the proceedings to Elizabeth um, and Audrey. Thanks so much, Alexis. So um, we're, just to give everyone a sense of what we're going to do, Audrey's going to give a talk. Um, and then we're going to reconvene for Q&A. So please feel free to submit your questions while she's speaking. And then we'll all come back together to answer this question. Audrey, take it away. Great. Thank you so much for inviting me to, to speak to you. Yeah, I'll confess, I suppose, at the at the outset, you know, I've spent I've spent over a decade now um, writing about education technology. I've published books on the topic, but I always kind of feel like a bit of an imposter when I speak at universities, particularly when I speak to departments of education and departments of psychology. Um, I've never taken a class on on either of those topics. And so it's, I have to say, it's a huge relief to be here speaking um, with my people, <laughs> my humanities people. Um, my, yeah, my formal academic background for what it's worth is in folklore and literature. Uh, the closest thing, I think, to that sort of formal academic expertise um, in what I do nowadays comes probably from all of that graduate level coursework I did in psychoanalytic theory. Um, for what it's worth, I wrote my master's thesis in folklore on political pranks. And I drew, um, I drew largely on Freud's work um, on jokes and their relation to the unconscious. So credentials, expertise or not, I don't think it's a stretch, right, to argue that Freud was, you know, one of the most influential theorists of the 20th century. Um, again, I can say that to a room of humanists. Um, I don't know if I would actually utter that out loud to a room of psychology professors. Pardon me if there are any um, on Zoom. 
Um, you know, it's a uh, colored my, uh, so a decade ago, I think I would have said that um, Freud was the most important, most influential, but as you, you can tell by the book, and if you can tell probably by my work, I've spent the last couple of years deeply immersed in another psychologist in the work of B.F. Skinner. Um, I've read books by him. I've read all the books by him. I've read books about him. I spent a week going through his archives at, at Harvard, pouring through his letters, some of the uh, minutia, I think that you can see that fits into the book as well as other correspondence that had nothing to do with the book that was just incredibly juicy to read through someone's letters. And I think it, you know, it's definitely colored my assessment spending that much time with him, but I am like this kid from the sixth sense insofar as instead of dead people, I see behaviorism everywhere. Um, you know, I think Skinner's cultural impact might, might not be as widely recognized as Freud's, but I, I just don't think his importance can be dismissed. Um, he was one of the best known public scholars of his day, right? Um, he appeared on television, on the cover of popular magazines, it's, this wasn't just a name that was known in academic circles. He wasn't just speaking at academic conferences or publishing in academic journals. He was a bestseller, best-selling author. Um, he was really a, a household name. In education technology circles, what, what I'm concerned with, he's best known for his work developing teaching machines, hence the name of my book. It was an idea he came up with um, in 1953 when he visited his daughter's fourth grade classroom and observed the teachers and the students with dismay. The students were seated at their desks, working on arithmetic problems written on the blackboard as the teacher walked up and down the rows of desks, looking at the students' work, pointing out mistakes um, that, she, that she saw. You know, he reported that some of the students finished the work very quickly and they squirmed in their seats with impatience waiting for, for the next set of instructions and other students squirmed in their seats with frustration because they were struggling to finish the assignment at all. And eventually the lesson was over, the teacher collected all of the, the work, she took the papers home, she would grade them and she would give them back to the class the next day. I realized that something must be done, he wrote in his autobiography. And this classroom practice violated two key principles of his behaviorist theory of learning. Students were not told immediately whether they had the answer right or wrong, right? A graded paper returned the next day didn't offer the kind of immediate positive reinforcement that Skinner believed was necessary for learning. And number two, the students were all forced to proceed at the same pace through the lesson, regardless of their ability or their understanding. And this sort of method of classroom instruction provided the wrong sort of reinforcement, negative reinforcement, which Skinner argued penalized the students who could move more quickly, as well as the students who were struggling to, to keep up. And this story, right, this narrative should sound very familiar, right? It's a story that it still gets told today. It's a narrative that ed tech advocates today tell. I mean, if Skinner were to deliver a TED talk, this would be his TED talk, right? So he went home and he developed a prototype of a mechanical device that he believed would solve these problems and not just solve them for his daughter's classroom, right? But for the entire education system. His teaching machine, he argued, would enable students to move through exercises that were perfectly suited to his or her level of skill, knowledge, that would assess their understanding of the concept immediately, giving positive feedback and encouragement along the way. He patented several versions of this device, and along with several other, many other competitors, he sought to capitalize on what became quite a popular subfield in education psychology in the 1950s and 60s, programmed instruction. The teaching machine wasn't the first time that B.F. Skinner made headlines, um, and he made a lot of headlines from this invention, in part because the press linked his ideas about teaching children, as Skinner did himself, to his research on training pigeons. Can people be taught like pigeons, Fortune Magazine asked in 1960. Um, Skinner's work training a rat named Pliny had led to a story in Life Magazine in 1937. 
And in 1951, there were a flurry of, of stories about his work um, on pigeons. He moved to Harvard at that time. Of course, as we know, research out of Harvard tends to, tends to generate headlines. And I love the headlines um, because many of them say things like, smart pigeons attend Harvard and Harvard pigeons are superior birds. Um, sort of, you can just, <laughs> anyway, you can just sort of see the, the Harvard narrative even when it comes to the animals in, in the psychology lab. And like many psychologists of his time, Skinner worked with, with animals. Um, at first with rats, briefly with squirrels, it didn't work out so well. And then I think famously, famously with pigeons in order to develop his techniques to shape and control behavior. And for Skinner, behavior equals learning, right? And using a system of reinforcements, food primarily, um, he was able to condition his lab animals to perform certain tasks, right? Pliny the rat, his famous rat, worked a slot machine for, the, for a living. That's what Life Magazine said. Um, it would put a marble in a tube in order to get food. His pigeons could play the piano, they could play ping pong, um, ostensibly guide a missile towards a target. That's, that's a whole other, that's a whole other keynote on um, missile guide, um, pigeon guided missiles. Um, in graduate school, Skinner had designed an operant conditioning chamber for training animals. It became known as the Skinner box. And that, cha that chamber typically contained some sort of mechanism for the animal to operate, right? Something to peck, something to a lever to move, and that would result in a shoot releasing a pellet of food. So it is perhaps unfortunate that when Skinner wrote an article for Ladies Home Journal in 1945, describing a temperature controlled, fully enclosed crib that he'd invented for he and his wife's second child, the, the same set child that whose classroom he visited, that the magazine ran with the title, Baby in a Box. The, the title that Skinner had given his piece was Baby Care Can Be Modernized, but we all know that writers don't get to choose the headlines, right? But it was a nod from the editors to the Skinner box, perhaps. I mean, witty for those in the know. I'm not sure the journal's readership were in the know. But the crib was quite literally a box. So Skinner's wife had complained to him about the toll that all the chores of a newborn had taken with their first child. And as he wrote in the article, quote, I felt it was time to apply a little labor-saving invention and design to the problem of the nursery. So Skinner's air crib, as this crib became, uh, eventually came to be called, allowed the baby to go without clothing, um, except for a diaper, no blankets. Um, except for feeding and diaper changing and playtime, the baby was kept in the crib the whole time. Um, Skinner argued that by controlling the environment, by making the crib soundproof um, and germ-free, the baby would be healthier and, and happier. Quote, it takes about one and a half hours each day to feed, change, and otherwise care for the baby, he wrote. This includes everything except washing diapers and preparing formula. We are not interested in reducing the time any further. As the baby grows older, it needs a certain amount of social stimulation. And after all, when unnecessary chores have been eliminated, taking care of a baby is fun. As you can probably imagine, responses to Skinner's article in the Ladies Home Journal fell largely into two camps, right? And there were a lot of letters in Skinner's archives um, from magazine readers. There were those who thought for the, this idea of the baby in a box bordered on child abuse or child neglect at the very least. And, but there were those who really loved the idea. Remember this is 19, this is um, post-war America, right? This is, um, they loved the idea of mechanizing, um, of mechanizing, the home and it was really part of this sort of growing desire after World War II to introduce all sorts of gadgets into the home, right? Into the home, into the workplace and, and into the school. And as history of psychology professor um, Alexander Rutherford argues, what Skinner developed with the crib and with his other work were these technologies of behavior. The air crib, the teaching machine, these inventions represented in miniature the applications of the principles that Skinner hoped would drive the design of the entire culture. Right? And he imagined this in his novel, um, utopian novel, I, I guess it's a utopian novel, Walden II. He imagined a community that would be um, socially 
and environmentally engineered to reinforce good behavior, to reinforce survival and good behavior. But this really wasn't just fiction for, for Skinner. He designed technologies that he believed would improve human behavior um, in an attempt really to re-engineer the entire social order in order to make the world a better place. The most important thing I can do, Skinner famously said, is to develop the social infrastructure to give people the power to build a global community that works for all of us adding that he intended to develop the social infrastructure for community, for supporting us, for keeping us safe, for informing us, for civic engagement, for inclusion of everyone. Okay, I lied, that, that actually wasn't Gia Skinner. That was Mark Zuckerberg, my dad. Did you, know, did you know that Mark Zuckerberg was a psychology major at Harvard? I, I digress. Um, it's too easy, I think, to say that Skinner's ideas are no longer relevant, right? That psychology has, has sort of advanced so far in the last half century and behaviorism has been proven wrong, right? I, I don't think that's true. Actually, I don't, I don't think that that's necessarily even true for, for Freud or for Skinner, bless their hearts. Um, like many people, right? Like many people, I got a dog during the pandemic and I have spent a lot of time um, in the last couple, in the last year or so, engaged in operant conditioning, right? In reinforcing good behavior. And I will say it works. And I have, I have the best behaved dog in the apartment building. Of course, um, Poppy is a dog. Poppy isn't a, a baby in, in the box. One of the stories that gets told a lot is that um, after the linguist Noam Chomsky published two particularly brutal reviews of Skinner's books, right? A review of his book, Verbal Behavior in 1959 and a review of Beyond Freedom and Dignity in 1971, sort of somehow everyone realized that behaviorism was wrong, um, not just scientifically wrong, but somehow politically wrong, morally, ethically wrong. And, Behaviorism was kind of tossed aside for cognitive science. And I think certainly cognitive science did become more popular in psychology departments in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, but I think the reason that people turned away from behaviorism was a lot more complicated than just that Noam Chomsky wrote some book reviews. Um, and certainly outside of academic circles, right? I think there were lots of factors that finally started to diminish what was Skinner's really incredible popularity in the, in the, in the 1950s and in the early 1960s. Um, so the film of Clockwork Orange, for example, probably did much more, I think, to shape public opinion about behavior, mod behavior modification than, than anything else. And so I spend quite a bit of time in the book on this. And I think that these are the sorts of cultural influences are really key to understanding changes in technology, often more than the tech itself. We get so caught up in telling the stories of gadgets as though the gadgets are what moves history forward that we often neglect to tell the story of the, so the social side of the story. And this probably makes me a cultural studies person who went to grad school in the nineties, but that's again, I, I digress. So let me just read you a quick excerpt from the book as, as one gets to do during a book talk. Um, by many accounts, both behaviorism and Skinner found themselves largely discredited following the publication of Beyond Freedom and Dignity, thanks in no small part to Chomsky's book review. In psychology departments around the country, cognitive science had become the dominant approach, but the academic debates were probably not the ones that came to shape the public's opinion of either behaviorism or Skinner. Most people would not have read Chomsky's book review. The public, however, did flock to watch a movie released in New York City in the closing days of 1971, Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. To be fair, the film based on Anthony Burgess's 1963 novel did not depict operant conditioning. Skinner had always argued that positive behavioral reinforcement was far more effective than aversion therapy than the fictional Ludovico technique that A Clockwork Orange portrays. In a futuristic Britain, Alex, played by Malcolm McDowell, is the leader of a gang of droogs who engage in a series of acts of ultraviolence, assault, rape, eventually murder. 
Alex is caught and sentenced to prison for 14 years. Two years into his sentence, he volunteers for an experimental treatment proposed by the Minister of the Interior, which promises to rehabilitate criminals after just two weeks. This treatment is the Ludovico technique. Alex is strapped to a chair, his eyes are clamped open, he's injected with nausea-inducing drugs. He's forced to watch violent and sexually explicit films while the music of his favorite composer, Ludwig von Beethoven, blares in the background. He's conditioned. The drugs, the music, the graphic depictions make him sick. After two weeks of treatment, the Minister of the Interior demonstrates Alex's progress to a group of officials. Alex is provoked with physical violence and a naked woman. His only response is nausea. The minister is triumphant, but the prison chaplain protests that this experiment has robbed Alex of his free will. The boy has no real choice, the chaplain complains. He ceases to be a creature of moral choice. The minister, his name, um, his middle name is, his name is Frederick, which is a nod I think, to, to uh, Skinner's middle name, Frederick, insists that Alex's mental processes are irrelevant. We are not concerned with motive, with a higher ethics, he retorts. We are concerned only with cutting down crime, only concerned with behavior. The education columnist for the New York Times, Fred Heckinger, someone who had a decade earlier, earlier written quite favorably about Skinner's teaching machines, castigated Kubrick and the film. Any liberal with brains should hate clockwork, not as a matter of artistic criticism, but for the trend the film represents. An alert liberal should recognize the voice of fascism. Both Kubrick and McDowell responded furiously with letters to the newspaper charging that Heckinger, not typically a film critic, had completely misconstrued the film and its underlying ideas. The movie did not celebrate fascism, Kubrick asserted. It condemned the new psychedelic fascism, the eye-popping multimedia quadrasonic drug-oriented conditioning of human beings by other human beings. Mr. Heckinger is no doubt a well-educated man, Kubrick concluded. But the tone of his piece strikes me at also that of a well-conditioned man who, res who responds to what he expects to find, who has been told or has read about, rather than to what he actually perceives a clockwork orange to be. Maybe he should deposit his grab bag of conditioned reflexes outside and go in and see it again, this time exercising a little choice. A decade after the publication of the novel, two years after the release of the film, Anthony Burgess wrote a lengthy essay about a clockwork orange, his thoughts on crime and punishment and behavior modification, with particular attention to the connections that his novel, of his novel to Skinner's book, beyond freedom and dignity. What I was trying to say, Burgess wrote, was it's better to be bad of one's own free will than to be good through scientific brainwashing. Skinner wanted to demonstrate that the latter, conditioning at least, was necessary and could be benevolent. But Burgess continued, our world is in a bad way, said Skinner. What with the problems of war, pollution and the environment, civic violence, the population expo explosion, human behavior must change. That much, he says, is self-evident and few would disagree. And in order to do this, we need a technology of behavior. Skinner had called for a technology of behavior of the right sort. It is, Burgess admitted, in the Skinnerian argument, conditioning of the wrong sort that turns the hero of Clockwork Orange into a vomiting paragon of non-aggression. But Burgess rejected that argument altogether. He did not believe there could be the right sort of behavioral conditioning. He believed, he said, in people's freedom to make bad decisions. He believed in their rights, in their dignity, and thanks to his Catholic upbringing, in the possibility of their redemption. Fascism in Europe, Burgess contended, had been a kind of a clockwork condition, a zestless ticking of the human machine. Skinner's machinery of behavior, behaviorism was poised to resurrect this. During the Nazi occupation of France, Burgess argued, people were at their least free. But paradoxically, they were at least free to recover a sense of dignity of human freedom. There was the resistance. There was the final and irreducible freedom to say no to evil. This is a right not available in a society concerned with reinforcing behavior. That a man might be willing to suffer torture and death for the sake of a principle is a kind of mad perversity that makes little sense in a behaviorist laboratory. And Skinner had said as much himself. His technology of behavior and that included the teaching machine was not interested in or committed to freedom. And that right there to me is the problem with ed tech, I think in a nutshell, right? It's particularly as it was construed by Skinner. And I think often as it is 
built and constructed still today. In so many ways, it is antithetical to freedom. It is so deeply concerned with shaping our behavior, yet it is antithetical to our freedom. I, and I think to be clear, you know, there were other reasons why, again, why Skinner, why Skinner um, became less popular, but I think it's important to recognize that behaviorism did not go away, right? Um, it didn't go away, not because the science of cognitive, the cognitive science somehow triumphed, um, but also it didn't go away because it's really part of the technologies of behavior that have persisted to this day. Um, there's a passage that I like to repeat um, from a, uh, an article by an education historian, Ellen Conville Legeman. She says, I've often argued to students, in, only in part to be per perverse, that one cannot understand the history of education in the United States during the 20th century unless one realizes that Edward L. Thorndike won and John Dewey lost. I'm, I'm guessing many of you know who these two men are. I'll, I'll give a, a quick biography nonetheless. Um, Thorndike was an education psychology professor at Columbia um, and who in the early 20th century developed his theory of learning like many of these men did based on animal behavior. Um, he gave us the concept of the learning curve, right? That is the time it takes for animals to escape a puzzle box after multiple tries. Um, and John Dewey on the other hand was a philosopher whose work at the University of Chicago's lab school I think was deeply connected to other social reformers in Chicago at the time, Jane Addams, Whole House, for example. Dewey was committed to educational inquiry as part of the democratic practices of community. Thorndike, on the other hand, um, was really worked in a lab and he was, his work helped to stimulate this sort of growing science and business of surveying quantifying, measuring, and testing students, right? And so you can think of this victory that um, Conley Flagman talks about in part as the triumph of multiple choice testing over project-based inquiry. Thorndike won, Dewey lost. You can't understand the history of education without recognizing this. And I don't think you can understand the history of education technology without recognizing this either. And I would add, one other piece to this. You can't understand the history of education technology in the United States during the 20th century unless you realize that B.F. Skinner won and Seymour Papert lost. Again, a, a quick biographical sketch here. Papert was a mathematician, computer science. He was a student of Jean Piaget, um, another key figure in education psychology. Papert was one of the founders of constructionism, um, which builds on Piaget's theory of constructivism, that is, learning occurs through the reconstruction of knowledge rather than through the transmission of knowledge. And in constructionism, in Papert's theory, learning is most effective when the learner constructs or builds something meaningful. So Skinner won, Papert lost. Thorndike won, Dewey lost. Behaviorism won. Um, it really bothers people when I say this, uh, like it's not aspirational or something, um, or maybe it sounds like we've surrendered. I don't think, I don't think we should surrender. Um, and I think that we've inherited this idea, which I tried really hard in my book not to reinscribe. We've inherited this idea that Skinner is a villain, right? And I think that people also like to point to things like maker safe spaces um, and argue that progressive education is thriving. But I would say that, you know, even in the face of all of this learn to code brouhaha that's happened over the last 10 years or so, that multiple choice testing still has triumphed in this country, really, over de democratically oriented inquiry. Um, and indeed, when you hear technologists tout coding, it's often about jobs. It's really not about a pathway to any other kind of anything else other than employment. And when we hear technologists champion personalized learning, it's far more likely to draw on Skinner's ideas, I think, than it is on Dewey's. Hence the subtitle of my book. I wanna draw a line from the kind of things that Skinner was talking about to the personalized learning today. 
you know, one of the places I think that Skinnerism really thrives today are in social technologies. Um, despite the field's insistence that it's moved on to cognitive science, right? Despite this cognitive turn, I do think that behaviorism um, is everywhere. You know, there's BJ Fogg and his persuasive technology lab at, at Stanford, for example. He's one of these innovators in this new practice of building hooks and nudges into technology. These folks, these folks like to point out what's been dubbed as the, the Facebook class, the class that Fogg taught that had um, students like Kevin Systrom and Mike Krieger, the founders of Instagram, um, Nir Isle, the, the author of the book Hooked. Um, they studied and developed techniques to make our apps and gadgets addictive, um, Wired said. Um, these technologies of behavior, I think we can trace back to Skinner, even if the technologists themselves don't do so. I think that we can see Skinner's continued engage, um, you know, I think we can see Skinner's work continue to appear in these technologies. Um, behavioral management remains a staple really of child rearing, of pet training, but often of education as well. Um, it's at the core of one of the most popular pieces of education technology today, Class Dojo. Um, behavior under, behaviorism really underscores this idea that how we behave, the data um, that we reveal when we behave, when we, when we click on things, can give engineers insights into what we think, into what we know, and how they can alter their software in order to better train us to certain ends. Interestingly, Michael Horn, who co-authored a number of books with Clayton Christensen about education disruption, and when he reviewed my book, he didn't like it, no big surprise. He said that my analysis was flawed because he said that we all know that nudges don't work. We all know that behaviorism doesn't work. No one in ed tech uses behaviorism. No one does this in any way ed tech, contrary to what I argue, ed tech is really all about freedom. Um, I think we call that gaslighting, trying to convince us, right, that when kids spend all day in cubicles pre-COVID pre or online on Zoom um, today, using sort of algorithmically enhanced software, that what we are seeing, aren't, we aren't seeing conditioning, we aren't seeing attempts to control. Um, I don't think he would admit that Skinner won. Um, of course, when folks like him insist that ed tech is about freedom, they are using that word, I think, in the Milton Friedman sense of freedom of the market and not so much in any kind of liberatory potential of technology. So if we look broadly, um, and I think Skinner did, um, technologies of behavior really aren't just about trying to train individuals, trying to condition individuals, they are really part of a broader attempt to re-engineer society. This is what Skinner wanted. And I think that this is, this is a goal of many technologists today, right? It's for your own good. The engineers will tell us, the entrepreneurs will tell us. Um, education reformers like, like Michael Horn say, you know, it's for the sake of the children, we wanna engineer a better society. For the sake of the global community, um, educational psychologists, technologists, philanthropists, psychologists, uh, Mark Zuckerberg would like to tell us, you know, and I think that's worth thinking about. What does it mean if, what does it mean for us um, if indeed so much of ed tech, so much of the technology that we are compelled to use is really about conditioning and control? Thanks so much, Audrey. That was, that was excellent and gave me tons of things to think about. Um, to get us started, um, maybe I'll ask, uh, you know, just a tiny question. Uh, if um, That was a lie. Um, if ed tech is not the future, or if, we, if it's not the future that we want for education, which I think we can all agree on <laughs> as humanists, um, then do you think that there are models for what we should be looking at that, you know, if we're, if the models are not the teaching machines, what are the historical models we should be looking to for the future? Yeah, this is such a great question. I mean, 
I'll answer this in a couple of, in a couple of different ways. One is I'm I'm often accused of being a luddite, and um, and I like to say hell yeah um, I'm a luddite because of course I think the luddites were um, I think the the when I think when I say that I don't mean that I'm anti technology I mean I'm I'm wearing glasses um, I I'm a big fan of technology. Um, You're currently I, on Zoom. <laughs> I'm currently on Zoom. We use, I mean, my room that I'm in has lovely windows, really appreciate the innovations that allow sunlight to get through. There are technologies that are education technologies um, that I like. The window is probably my favorite education technology. For those of us who've ever taught or been in a classroom without windows, we know windows are great. When I say I'm a Luddite though, you know, the Luddites also used technology. The Luddites were not weaving by hand, the Luddites were using looms. What they were opposed to were the looms that were mechanized and owned by someone else. They were opposed to this idea that they would no longer have control over their labor and that the, the material that they made would be extracted from them in exchange for wages. So it was about, it was about resisting this sort of extraction and economic exploitation. It wasn't just Loons are bad, um, and I think that that's what I like. To, that's what I like to think of with technology, right? With it's the digital technologies today. Like, can we think about ways in which we use technologies, digital technologies, even that aren't that based on this extractive um, process, that aren't interested in shaping our behaviors, ones in which we have the power to influence and shape? For me, I think some of this comes back to the original idea. Um, of the web, um, which is flawed, which is definitely flawed um, in, in its own way. But the idea of the web as being a place that the exchange of scholarly work can happen, and that one can one can participate on the web as a scholar um, by posting one's by posting one's work online on one on one's on one's own website, um, and I think. To, I'm, I really support the idea of students um, having their own website. I'm really keen to see students, and it, this doesn't have to just be college students. I think students of, of any age really are, are able to be scholars, are able to participate in scholarly, in scholarly in inquiry and able to sort of develop and engage in scholarly, in scholarly ideas. One gets better at it ideally, in college, one gets even better at it in graduate school. But I think that there are many ways in which we could we could recognize students as being contributors of um, to inquiry rather than just being fillers out of worksheets, which is what so much of education technology sees us sees it as, and is as in addition is really interested in extracting from students their data. Um, in, in, and shaping students' beha behavior. And to me, I think this, we have to think about other models, other ways in which we have, that students have more abilities to not just be shaped by the technology, but have a say, have a say in their own, in their own inquiry. Yeah, that's great. And we have a, a follow-up question from Michael Lint, our director, um, on this topic. He says, do you think that much education technology carries with it a conception of knowledge that sees knowledge as largely passive, if as a largely a passive, if rapid acquisition of accurate information, as opposed to a more creative grasp or understanding. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think that that's you know, I think that that's a pretty common idea uh, of of education, and of course, I think that that's one of the things that that many engineers sort of glob onto and then say, what we need to do now is to make this more efficient. Um, and by efficient, I think they mean faster, and of course, asterisk cheaper as well. I mean, this was this is sort of the promise of a lot, a lot, so many education technologies, so many of the things that um, that get bandied about in, in headlines, right? Is that I remember being in a classroom or in a in a meeting with um, Sebastian Thrun, the artificial intelligence professor from Stanford slash Google, who, who founded the MOOC startup Udacity. And his idea was sort of imagine if we could, you could sort of learn French in a weekend, 
right? It's this sort of matrix idea. Like imagine if you could just get the, the you know, get this sort of in, in thing, thing in the back of your brainstem and you know Kung Fu like Neo does. And to me, my response, not to the Neo part, but the, spark, the, the response to, to Thrin was, imagine if we actually had a, imagine if we cared enough to say, you have a lifetime to understand these things rather than saying you have, you know, we want, we want everything to be done. Effic efficiency is such a weird, it's such a weird metric um, for something like learning. If you're genuinely interested and curious, you want to spend the rest of your life, um, you want to spend the rest of your life doing it. It's not necessarily something that you need to sort of cram into a, a long weekend. Um, it's just, a, it's just a different model. And I think that that model of transmission, this idea of efficiency, um, cert, and this idea, you know, and, and standardization and automation are this sort of engineer's model that then really shapes the way in which these, the, software, the software gets built. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things that I think you do a really good job of demonstrating in the book is that these, the sort of initial impetus in the timeline you're talking about is a kind of, uh, is, is sort of about scale, right? Like as public education gets bigger and bigger and there are more and more students, we now have this problem where, you know, a teacher doesn't have a classroom of, you know, maybe 15 kids, they have 30 kids and they have 30 kids in six blocks a day or whatever. Yeah. And so some of the, the desire to have this technology seems like a desire to solve the problem of scale when the problem, when it seems like the problem of scale would be better solved by more teachers. <laughs> yeah, and it's solved the problem of scale, right? It's, it's this, I mean, it's such an American thing too. Like, so we have this institution of public education, you know, you, you still hear this language today, it gets, it gets degraded as mass education, this fear that somehow, because we're, we expect students, um, all students to move through our public education system that it's standardized and somehow, you know, somehow the big fear is that we will lose our individuality. And so how do, how do we reconcile, how do we reconcile moving everybody through the same education and making sure that everyone's individuality is, is, is um, individual needs are met, but also encouraged. Um, and it seems counterintuitive in some ways, but the answer for engineers, the answer for educational psychologists is in order to personalize education, what we have to do is automate it. Um, we have to sort of, we'll, have, we'll standardize it um, and then we can sort of get, get these little standardized pieces to you in precisely, precisely the right time and precisely the right dosage at the level with the skill that you need. So there's, so the personalized learning, pers personalized education, I think sounds really good. It definitely appeals to Americans like, hell yeah, it's all about me. Um, but I think that that's what it means. It doesn't, it doesn't mean, oh, you get to study butterflies and you get to study astronomy and you get to spend your time, you know, reading novels. <laughs> it just, it means we've got a standardized curriculum and we're going to deliver it to, we're gonna automate the delivery to you in the way that's sort of dialed in um, based on the data that we know about you. And we've been collecting data and interested in that project, which is what I think what my book shows for over a century. Technologists today like to say that, you know, we're in the era of big data. We have all this data that we've never had before about students. And some of that's true, but also we have education psychologists have been very interested in collecting huge amount and crunching huge amounts of data about students for over a century. And so this idea of personalization through big data, again, it's it's not it's not a new idea. It's 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 quite old. And we've layered, we've layered practices, we've layered educational practices, our testing regime, and we've developed our education technology on top of, I think, this desire to automate um, through big data and, and individualize through the collection of data. Yeah, it strikes me that the only thing that these teaching machines personalize is the rate at which you learn. Not anything else about the learning, just the rate at which you go through the- Pretty lesson. much. Yeah. yeah, I, you know, when I was writing the book, I thought I gotta, I gotta get my hands and figure out like what this experience was like, because it's, it's so much like the, the reporting that you see today um, in which, 
everything is sunshiny. And like every time, you know, I think back to when iPads came out, every article that came out was like, oh my God, these are so amazing. And children are so happy. They're dancing in the hallways because they have iPads. What a, you know, what a joy, what a joy it is for everyone to have an iPad. And now, you know, if you have, if you know students who, who spend a lot of time and like, it's just worksheets. I'm just doing worksheets on my iPad. So I wanted to get my hands on, um, on a teaching machine from the 1960s. Um, and in case anyone's interested in sort of any sort of old technology, the place that one goes to do this, of course, sadly, is eBay. Um, there were a lot of, uh, of teaching machines, these sort of plastic devices that were part of the encyclopedia sales folks would go door to door. If you buy a set of encyclopedias, they'd throw in a teaching machine. Um, so I got my hands on a, a, a teaching machine made by TMI, Teaching Machines, Inc. Uh, and their coursework on, uh, it was intro to electricity, a um, big fat thing that you sort of move through. And again, this is very Skinnerian. and Skinner only wanted positive reinforcement. So each, each, each little bit of knowledge is very small because you want the student to only get the right answer. You don't want negative, like getting the wrong answer is negative. So you only want positive behavioral reinforcement. So you only want the right answer. And so it moves through the content so slowly. Um, it's like 800 pages. And I think I made it through like four questions of, uh, of this, but it's, it's so, it's so dull. Um, but it's so reminiscent, I think, of the kind of busy work that still gets you know, that we still see today, um, the sort of view that, yeah, I get to move through my own pace through the intro to electricity course, yay. But that, oh, that my own pace is pretty much never gonna finish it <laughs> because it was so, so dull. That's like the stats you hear about, like the number of people who finish any given MOOC, right? Of the of the percentage of people who sign up, and it's you know some tiny, tiny percentage of people who actually finish any given course, because yeah, and I think it's the, you know it is the thing too where, you know, when when these technologies came into the into the classroom in the in the early nineteen sixties, students were excited. It was cool. It was cool to be part of a pilot program in which you got to you know you got to do your work on a machine like that's seemed cool and even cooler was when you discovered that because you were moving at your own pace you didn't there was less interaction with a teacher and so if you could move really quickly you you know you could move through the algebra work and you didn't you didn't have to wait for anybody you, um, there was no homework also a bonus I mean ask a student to sign up for a pilot program in which there's no algebra homework and <laughs> hell yeah you, you know and so students, students were really pleased for the first year or so of a pilot program. And then it doesn't, it's, you know, it's, it's less endearing after a while. Yeah, one of the things uh, you point out in the book is that people often blame teachers for not wanting to take on these technologies. And you've often, and you found that often it's more that there's way, there's a, sort of a myriad of forces working against the adoption of these technologies. But do you have a sense of what teachers, if students only liked it for a little while in these pilot programs, do you have some feedback from teachers and what they thought of these pilot programs? It was so interesting. I mean, again, like I said, so much of the media um, that I discovered really reminded me of the way in which um, education technology and technology reporting um, happens still today. You could tell that there were a couple of corporations that were really good about when a reporter was working on a story saying, you should talk to this teacher, you should talk to this principal, this superintendent. And those, that teacher, that superintendent, that principal were quoted in almost all of the magazine articles, almost all of the newspaper articles with glowing reviews of, of the technology. I mean, if you look closely, you can sort of see often um, in Ed Surge, for example, it's like the same handful of teachers that that reporters turn to again and again about about these stories. And so, um, there were some studies, and there were there were there were often sort of um, frustrating to say that there were a couple of teachers who weren't on board with this new technology. There were definitely teachers that didn't that just um, didn't want to rethink, uh, didn't want to incorporate the 
the technology into the classroom. There weren't teachers that, that, um, that found it to be useful with the way in which they taught. But by and large, I think the mainstream story was teachers, you know, the innovative teachers, teachers who are on the cutting edge um, want to use these te new technologies and do. Then again, you know, m most teachers, I mean, this wasn't really a technology that was widely adopted by schools. And I think that others, you know, we've, we've seen that time and time again, where a principal will get really excited, a superintendent will get really excited, invest a, invest a ton of money on new technologies. These technologies, um, you know, and some, some teachers do end up incorporating them, but after a while, after a year or two, they end up, you know, in the closet. You can see this with interactive whiteboards, for example, which I think, you know, we're, we're a technology that we're supposed to once again revolutionize education. Um, a, lot of, a lot of money was invested in this and teachers were like, yeah, yeah okay, whatever. Um, but they weren't, they weren't necessarily transformative. And now by and large, well, <laughs> particularly with the pandemic, I mean, interactive whiteboards just aren't really a thing any longer. Unless you still have one in your classroom and they can't afford to replace it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but even then it's not necessarily, you know, you, it's not certainly used in a transformative kind of way. Like no, it's honest. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're not that different from when my teachers in high school would write on transparencies totally. on an overhead projector. It's functionally the same thing, just fancier. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of questions from the audience. I'm going to start with this question from Eric Berg. Um, who says, on the topic of automation, with uh, recommendation algorithms in charge of feeding the next video or post to users of platforms, do you think there's a potential of shaping not only what people learn and see, but also what people want to learn or want to see, a reinforcing feedback loop, so to speak? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that one of the places that we actually see this already in, in education is with guidance counseling. So, of course, um, because of budget cuts, many public schools, most public schools even, do not have guidance counselors or do not have a sufficient number of guidance counselors for the number of students. Um, so guidance counselors might have, you know, three to 500 students per guidance counselor. And so increasingly these are um, guidance counselors um, and career counseling and college counseling rely on algorithms to help students decide where to go to college um, and what to major in. Um, or what to indicate on, on college applications, what they, what they should major in. And these absolutely do influence um, the kinds of decisions that colleges or that students make. Um, at college, some schools have also adopted um, software that recommends courses for students to take. And this, unfortunately, so much of this software is black boxed. We don't we don't actually know what goes into the algorithms that, that feed it. So we can't, you know, you can't necessarily pinpoint and, and say um, it's making, it's making a, a decision based on, you know, um, we can't actually sort of see how the decision gets, how the decision gets made. But students are certainly being um, steered away from particular degrees, students are being steered away from particular schools. And no surprise, that often does have um, implications along race, um, gender, um, students of color, for example, um, steered towards community colleges, for example, um, away from Ivy League schools. Um, students of color steered away from engineering majors um, towards um, majors that are seen as easier, um, like business, I don't know, like psychology, maybe, sorry. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do think, I do think that it's not just, it's not just in the kinds of algorithm, the, the YouTube algorithms that we've definitely seen in the last five years or so steer us towards uh, um, uh, refusing to believe that people landed on the moon, um, that in vaccinations, uh, it's not just sort of knowledge at that level, but even within school, even within schooling, I think that we're definitely starting to see students being steered away from certain classes, students being steered away from certain applying to certain universities. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> uh, we have one additional question. Um, 
This is from Yohei Garashi, our Director of Digital Humanities and Media Studies. Um, and says, uh, a question not from a jock, but from someone who doesn't mind learning stuff online. He says, there are some similarities between learning a subject and learning a physical activity. I wonder what you would say about sports, which might be a domain where there are clear residues of Skinnerian conditioning in the process of learning, repetition, positive or negative reinforcement, et cetera. I suppose athletic training of this kind is behaviorist, but isn't it also somewhat effective? I mean, I think that this is, this is always the, this is, I think, the dilemma of of behaviorism for me. Um, one, and one of the realisms, realizations that I had as I was sort of finishing up the book and, and working, with my, working with my dog. And I think that is that it is really effective. Um, behaviorism, you know, I think that if, if you look at the, the ways in which a lot, of, um, a lot of education programs work as well, the ways in which a lot of teachers teachers understand behaviors and parents understand behaviorism. I mean, I think that they're, you know, I, I think that it is, it is incredibly, it is incredibly effective. I think that the, the, the problem is, I think the problems are, are, are multiple. I think that we can, but one of the problems I think is that when, when these things get hard coded into technology, it's a bit like the black box algorithm. It's much harder for us to unpack it or make changes or give, you know, give the, um, give our subject, give our pigeon a chance to express um, their freedom. Um, because we, we actually don't have a full understanding, we don't have full insight into the way in which their behavior is being, is being shaped. Um, but yeah, I think that, I mean, I do think that we know that behaviorism is, in, is incredibly effective. But I think that, that that should give us, that probably should give us pause um, and not just steamroll forward. Um, uh, with it. But yeah, I mean, I think that, I, I think that one of the things I often talk about is the, the learning management system, or even actually something like Zoom, right? You know, when you think about the, the infrastructure of the classroom, um, there are things that we, well, there are the classrooms that we all sigh when we find that we've been assigned to teach in them, or as we have a classroom a class in them, right? The, the classrooms without windows, for example, or, but particularly the ones where the chairs are nailed down. Because I think we we understand that even though the classrooms, many classrooms still have rows of desks in them, um, particularly us human, humanists, we do like to rearrange the classroom so that everyone's sitting in a circle. We understand that the power dynamics are different in the circle, that different things happen with discussion. Um, there's a different, there's just, a, a different way of both teaching and learning when the space has been rearranged. But we can't rearrange the furniture, if you will, of the learning management system. We can't rearrange the furniture of Zoom. We don't have access, we don't have access to the code. Um, even if we did have access to the code, many of us don't have the skills to, to sort of rearrange, rearrange the architecture of the technology. And I think that that's one of the challenges that we face with so many of these technologies is that um, that means then that we are really stuck with the pedagogies that the creators of the technology design, the, the kinds of teaching that they imagine to happen, the kinds of learning that they imagine to happen. Um, they, that there, there isn't a, a way that we can sort of, you know, and the, the, the kind of teaching and learning that happen, that, um, that, the, that happen in classrooms where the desks, you know, there is a way in which the university imagined teaching and learning with the rows of desks, right, with the giant auditoriums, that, but there are ways in which we can resist that and we can work around that. It just gets much harder, I think, with, with technology to do that. It gets much harder it can be much harder for us to sort of help our students sort of um, uh, resist resist the kinds of pedagogies that are more dictatorial, that are more authoritarian, that are more extractive. And so I think that that's I think that that's one of the challenges that that we face. Yeah, yeah, I've definitely been stuck in a classroom that didn't have desks that moved and had to either request a new classroom or reimagine the way I was organizing the entire class because it required desks that move. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and these, th these technology technologies, they do shape, constrain our pedagogy. 
right? And I think that, you know, when we think about what is the pedagogy that Silicon Valley, for example, I'll use the shorthand, that technologists, education technologists imagine teaching and learning. We know this. We know they imagine teaching and learning to look a certain way. Um, their, their vision of, the, of, of, a, of good teaching and learning looks a certain way. And that's how these, these things get designed. Or, or also they don't think at all about teaching and learning, which is another problem. But, but yeah, I mean, I think that we are then stuck in the classroom without the movable chairs. So often with ed tech, we're sort of stuck with what their vision their vision of efficient, organized, automated, um, algorithmic education, transmission of knowledge, you know. Yeah, that's great. Um, I, have, I have one more question and we have one more in the Q&A. Do you think we have time for two more? Let's do it. Okay, so uh, Jonathan Martinez says, um, can you talk more about the concept of Skinner having won, um, but the fact that we shouldn't lose hope even though Skinner has won? Um, <laughs> Uh, he says, is it in a more unified and expanded theory of critical digital pedagogy, perhaps? Mm -hmm. So, good question. So I have a talk coming up that, so I'm known as Edtex Cassandra, which I did not choose that name for myself because I know what happened to Cassandra, man, I don't, I don't want that. Um, that said, I do tend to be the person who says, hey, let's not wheel that shiny horse into the university because that's gonna be a bad idea. Um, so I get it. So I'm not known as the person with like the sunny, happy, everything's gonna be amazing, technology is wonderful. That is not me, that's not my thing. So I'm giving a talk in a couple of weeks and about the future and about hope because I do think hope um, is really important and I, I am hopeful. One of the reasons that I am hopeful is because I know history. And I think that there is the way in which amnesia, right, this sort of ed tech amnesia, and it's an amnesia that the tech industry really has embraced. The tech industry does not believe in understanding history, does not want to know about history. They only want to talk about the future. I think we have to know history. I think that, but I think that I find hope in history because I know looking back at the history of teaching machines even, that there was resistance. There was always resistance. People have always refused and said, no, this is a terrible idea. Um, we aren't alone in our refusal. That technology hasn't been triumphant. It never has been triumphant, right? That despite, you know, um, Thomas Edison who said, you know, you know, we're gonna get, in a few years, we'll get rid of textbooks and they'll be replaced by, replaced by film like he wasn't literally invested in that future, right? That's just not happened. Despite all of these predictions that the future is going to be more and more technological, that we should just hand over the reins to public education to engineers and entrepreneurs, it just hasn't happened, right? So I think we, we can look to the past and understand that resistance is possible um, and that resistance is, is, is not futile. I think that we, I think that's incredibly important. So that's one of the reasons, that's one of the reasons why I have hope. And I also know that these things are not natural, right? The, the way in which the education system is, um, and it's pretty screwed up, right? I mean, I think it's, as much as I am a critic of the technology industry, it's impossible to be a defender of the university, for example, is the way in which the institute, the institution's own history, in a way in which is manifested today. I think it's, I think it's, um, it's not good. But these are man, these are sort of human-made institutions, right? We did not sort of inherit um, these immutable institutions. People who say schools haven't changed in hundreds of years, bullshit. Schools have changed a lot. Schools change all the time. Change is possible, right? And so, we aren't stuck with these. If you know, the Ursula Le Guin said, like, if, if humans made this, right, and it is incumbent upon us to, to dismantle it. And I think that we absolutely can. So that's, that's where I have hope. That's great. Thank you. Um, uh, Jonathan wonders if you can share the details of that talk, if it's something. I will post the, that talk to my website. There you go. Yeah. Um, so yeah, on, on actually that same note of 
sort of what we learn from this history, I think the book is sort of very subtle <laughs> and that it doesn't, it, it's not, um, uh, I, I feel like the, the argument of the book, the sort of historical argument it's making is pretty subtle because it's, it's very invested in telling this narrative um, in a way that I think is incredibly effective. And I wondered if you wanted to just as a way of closing, talk a little bit about why you thought this particular history was so important to tell. So that's funny you should say. So as I was writing it, there was a part of me that wanted to be almost every paragraph, you know, being like, and this is exactly what happens today. <laughs> so there were all of these resonances that I saw, you know, the ways in which business works, the way in which sort of this expectation that somehow good science is going to triumph and that good science, whatever that means in terms of, you know, in terms of education. Um, but the way so many of the arguments that robots will replace teachers, that you know, machines are coming for our jobs, that the future will be more technological, automation is just around the corner. All of these arguments were, to me um, that were, again, almost a century old, seemed like the arguments, that, the talking points that we still hear today. And I really want, didn't want to sort of say, oh my God, doesn't this sound exactly like what Saul Khan says in his TED talk? Um, although I did do a little bit of that in the introduction. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I, well, I just lost my train of thought. What was the, what was the, what was your question again? Um, what, what you think telling this particular history, oh. why, why we need to know this particular history? Yeah, I mean, part, part of it is, I think, to sort of resist this idea that, that technology is inevitable. Right, I think that that is that is such a powerful narrative about computers in education, but about computers in in general, about technology in general. I mean, we really tend to tell these stories in which um, we have like it's just like the the train is coming, and there's just no way that we can possibly uh, stop it. There's nothing that we can do. Um, I you hear this you hear this with almost any kind of new technology. And I, I wanted to tell a story that demonstrated that folks, like I said before, folks have been really interested, education psychologists have been very interested for a century in automating education in order to individualize education. So one, people who say that today might be trying to sound really innovative, but actually they're quite old fashioned. Right, they are, they are so passe. They are so passe that like, that's what Edward Thorndike was talking about. Get on the program. Like, let's talk like some 21st century ideas instead of early 20th century ideas. Um, but yeah, that, that this idea that, you know, this, this, isn't, this isn't new, um, that we've seen this, we've, we've heard this for a long time, but that resistance is possible, refusal is possible. Um, and that the way in which technologies have come to be today this kind of this we've inherited we've inherited this um, from the past we've inherited this idea of behaviorism but that once we know that history again we can we can recognize it we can see these patterns in our own practices we can see these patterns in technology like the poor sixth sense kid right we can sort of identify it and say is this is the is this actually a path to kind of this is this kind of the liberatory vision for me? It's is this sort of this vision, liberatory vision of education? Is there a different way forward? Is there something else we can be thinking about? Is there something else we can be doing other than just replicating this behaviorist model in our teaching practices, um, in our teaching technologies? That's great. Thank you so much. This was excellent. Um, Thank you. And I thoroughly enjoyed the book. Everyone should go and get it and read it because it is excellent um, and very informative and just an excellent history. Thank you. Thank you. That means a lot.